Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for the third Sunday of Easter, which falls on April 14th, 2024, will be Acts chapter 3, verses 12 through 19, Psalm 4, 1 John 3, 1 through 7, and Luke chapter 24, verses 36b through 48. We are continuing the responses to the rumors of the resurrection that we continue to explore for 2,000 years. That's a great way to set it up, Joy, because that's exactly what we get, right, in these in these, uh, particularly these first couple of Sundays of Easter, is what is the response to the resurrection? And it becomes, a, I think, a really important homiletical entry, right, into how would we respond to the resurrection and what are our, what are our questions and what are our lingering wonderings about it? And, and thinking about how the resurrection is not just this, you know, one time, we've talked about this before, but this one time, you know, Easter Sunday, but what difference does a resurrection, resurrection makes for our lives? And when I look at the Luke text, that's, that's really what's at stake here, because in the previous verses, you have the, the disciples saying, they were saying, this is in verse 34, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. And then what you really get in when Jesus appears to his disciples in verse 36 is, okay, well, what does that confession actually mean, right? What, is, what does it mean to say the Lord has risen? How am I going to talk about that? What is that going to look like? What am I expecting? And so you get these really real expectations of or or wonderings about a body and whether there, you know, whether Jesus is like a ghost or a hologram or what's going on what are what are our expectations of resurrection and and so i think connecting this passage back to that claim that confession in 34 is important in the awe, um, a couple of weeks ago, um, Matt reminded us to maintain the um, enchantment of the story. Um, it's a very real response to seeing someone you didn't expect to see, even after you've made the confession. They were startled. They were terrified. They thought they were seeing a ghost. And the response of the one who promises peace in their presence is why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your heart? I wonder what it might mean if we consider that question for us, rather than seeing that as a negative, but seeing that as a position that sometimes we do hold when things get difficult for us, when um, there are unanswered questions when there are texts that are tough. Um, we begin to allow doubts to rise. And rather than judge ourselves on that, what if we were to see this as the God who could raise Jesus from the dead is promising to be with us in our very real lives? So look around us and take this real response and place it in the question of Jesus is risen, or in the response that Jesus is risen. I have a different direction to go. I mean, just to kind of like supplement all that, or to build on it, or think uh, in 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 additional ways. What's interesting about Easter in year B is you've got you've got Mark, John, and Luke all crashing together in the span of a couple of weeks. And all of those gospels, I think, have got some really different perspectives on Easter and the experience and asking the so what question. And so here with Luke, and in some ways, we've started to touch on this, if you read from Acts 10 on Easter Sunday, the question of what does it mean to bear witness to the resurrection? And so there's no promise here that Jesus is going to reveal himself to everybody in Jerusalem, or that there's going to be some kind of, of massive demonstration or display of the reality of resurrection. And so the final line here, you are witnesses of these things, 
is so important because in part, I think it throws us back onto the witness of the church, which I think is really important for Luke, really important for Acts. And that's a different thing, I think, in terms of the life of faith and in terms of what preaching in the Easter season might look like. In other words, it might be less about taking us back in time and kind of imagining encountering the risen Jesus and more asking the question, what does it mean to locate yourself in a community that bears witness to something that none of us have firsthand experience with in the same way that's described here, but to talk about what does it mean then to be part of a community that bears witness? And I would say that bears witness too, not to the idea of resurrection as an abstraction or the possibility of life after death, but to bear witness to the idea of an embodied Jesus who still exists somewhere, some way, somehow. And to think about what does that mean for the church, that instead of trying to, you know, argue people into or persuade people in certain ways about resurrection or about certain tenets of faith, that we have to think about what does it mean really to think about resurrected embodiment and how that begins now and how is the, how is the church, capital C, small c, however you want to define it, a physical, organic, <laughs> you know, living witness and to take our role in that as people who have not seen and have not touched Jesus in the same way the text described. I don't know what that looks like, but I think it's a different way of imagining kind of the approach into Easter that might click with some people in your congregation more than others. Yeah, I really like that. I do too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The invitation to be a part of a community mm -hmm. that bears witness to this miracle. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Which part of me doesn't like because, you know, we live in an age of such skepticism toward the church, especially in this country, right? And people have been burned by churches and we would rather separate ourselves from certain <laughs> articulations of the faith and try to kind of purify ourselves in our smaller groups than we would embrace that bigger, messy community. But I think, I think in that, uh, I appreciate that, Matt, because I think in that, what you've done is actually given a response to the direction that I took. Why do you doubt? Well, I <laughs> might doubt because of the experience I've had from those who claim the name of the community who really haven't borne witness to the presence of God, to the presence of Jesus. Um, and, and so you're bringing us back to bearing witness to this reality means anytime I've been wounded by a person who bears that name or a community that bears that name that has lifted up anything other than what Jesus lifts up. And over the next few weeks, we will be talking again just about what it is that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection means for us. Um, so I, I love that. Even in, Obviously, I brought up doubt. <laughs> Even in the midst of our doubt and disappointment, when we turn our eyes to Jesus, oh, that might be a hymn worth singing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think I think too. This is where I would I would maybe add a verse, or uh, you could reference it because because we're we're at the end of Luke, but we're not at the end of the story, and. So you get, and see, I am sending upon you what my father promised, which seems to point to the gift of the spirit and, and the presence of the, of the spirit. And, uh, and that is something that is really critical for witness as well. When you think about, okay, how am I, how am I going to confess this, whether it's individually or in a communal setting, how is that even possible and and you look forward to one eight, right? Will you be witnesses? What's the order? Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, and the rest of the world, or something like that. You mm -hmm. almost had it. Almost, almost got it. Almost. We've almost. I'm almost. I'm working on you too with Acts. <laughs> but uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Judea, Samaria. Okay, at the ends, at the ends of the earth. So well, it's on home, and then our our closest neighbors or our closest enemies, the Samaritans, yeah. and yeah. then the rest of the world. Yeah. Yes. So how is that even possible? How how can we even imagine that? Because it's not 
it's not only this this witness to what the resurrection means for us and what it means for community, uh, what what it looks like and sounds like in a community, but it's the witnesses for the sake of the ends of the earth and and this good news for the ends of the earth. And that's only possible because of the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so it gives, I think, a, a preacher an opportunity to look ahead a little bit uh, to Pentecost and and think th- that that Pentecost is not only this you know giving of the Holy Spirit, but an empowering by the uh, Holy Spirit to move into Pentecost and keep proclaiming the promises of the resurrection. So we're not limiting the resurrection to the seven Sundays of Easter, and then we're done. And uh, but how just pointing out how 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 Luke and the yeah, Luke is just pushing us forward. And Pentecost, right? Sorry, and Pentecost in that regard is more than just missionary energy. It's mm-hmm. where have people encountered the risen Christ? We've got Cleopas and his companion in Emmaus around a table. Uh, if we're going to keep adding verses to Luke twenty-four, they're going to spend time worshiping together in the temple. Jesus also talks about uh, interpreting scripture here, which I, I, when he says you are witnesses of these things, that's also part of what he's talking about. Is the mm-hmm. churches overall way of making sense of not just scripture and the church's history or the people of God's history, but making sense of the world. So it's, you know, see, I mean, it's more than just a kind of evangelistic impulse Mm -hmm. of add numbers, add numbers, add numbers, or grow, 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 grow. It's Mm -hmm. worshiping life. It's the, the life of the mind around scripture and around the ways in which you view the world. It's taking care of a neighbor around a table. All those things are part of it. And I wonder if if all of this might then take us into Acts. Which becomes another way of seeing um, that, that continues what you were just po- pointing out, um, Matt, the different ways in which um, the presence of God is now made evident. Yeah. Um, so again, here, I'm going to go in the scene just before the verses that we read. They have seen a healing. Um, something that was um, a, a central part of Jesus' um, ministry, and and now it happens again, and Peter is able to use that as an on ramp for bearing witness to what God has always been doing, made evident in Jesus. Yeah, exactly. See, I love it. You're both adding verses to Luke and to Acts. This, is, this makes me so happy. <laughs> Warm your, you know? Warms your heart. Can you tell my Acts commentary is almost done? I want to connect <laughs> everything to everything else. Uh, I'm going to say, too, you talked about looking at what comes before. Absolutely. This comes after the, the healing of a man in the name of Jesus. And that question of the name of the power will become important. It'll become important next week because they'll get arrested after this. Peter and John will. Are you seeing the name? Yeah. You also, I think, really have to add verses 20 and 21. Mm for two reasons. One is just syntax, because in Greek, at the end of 19, you've broken a sentence. <laughs> you do even in English. So you've broken a sentence in half, which is right. always a disaster. And uh, But also theologically, they cut it off here with where your sins may be wiped out. But it goes on to talk about times of refreshment coming. It goes on to talk about the new creation or the prophetic vision of like a shalom that's going to break in. And so it's it's just too small the way it ends right there. So I this is I know we talk about adding verses all of the time. This time you really have to do 20 and 21. You can go to verse 26 if you want, but then you're going to open the door to some conversations about supersessionism. And so that only if you're up for that, but at least 21 and 22 or 20 and 21. 21. Mm-hmm. Which again talks about how does the resurrection point us to the future? How is the resurrection more than just victory over death or Jesus is still around? But how does it play a part in God's overall design or intention to bless the whole world? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. That universal restoration, um, that until the time of the universal resurrection, uh, uh, restoration. Also, um, if you don't add, in my opinion, agreeing with you, if you don't add um, uh, 20 and 21, uh, then what you miss is that the wiping out of sins is not what they were responding to. This whole thing was a response to a physical restoration. And that is what Jesus 
was doing, and that is what God has always been doing. Well, and I think too, that pushing into 20 and 21 takes you back to verse 15 of this really interesting, uh, this interesting label for Jesus of the author of life and uh, which can also be translated originator or founder. And so then it, it puts resurrection in this larger framework of life and, and how is it that God's, God's presence and salvation in Jesus is not not only about resurrection, but the flourishing of life. And and so that that pushes our understandings, I think, of resurrection uh, into those those places and spaces where we can see how life flourishes and how and how creation is coming out of nothing. Life is coming out of what seems to be, uh, what seems to be dead. And so it just casts, as I said, just a wider vision uh, for, I think, people to talk about what resurrection means to them, particularly on a daily basis and not just on Easter Sunday, as I said before, and not just in connection with a future life with God. Mm -hmm. That future has come. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's not just the absence of death, which is what we often talk about, about death overcoming. Like, what's the positive or the other side of that coin? Mm -hmm. I think we're touching on that mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, for Acts, the, you know, the resurrection is not the only thing, but in many ways, it's the beginning of the thing. Um, of course, you can't have a resurrection without a crucifixion, and the incarnation matters for all of that. But and I think Acts wants to nail down exactly where salvation happens. I think it's kind of in the whole package. Mm -hmm. But uh, and again, this is after the coming of the Spirit, and the Spirit is bearing witness to this community of resurrection, this community of new life that in some ways manifests itself, not just through what it teaches, but through the fact that it's able to provide healing to this man in chapter three. It's able to provide these communities where people care for one another, where there's no needy people uh, yeah. in its orbit. I think that's an important it, it, it's a it's an important observation as well Matt in that it's not again it's that where you see flourishing of life but that you also are caught up in that flourishing right to tend to other other people's flourishing it's not just about you it's not just about it's not just about being able to name it and see it, but how are you actively engaging in life-giving activity for the other? Uh, and that life is the the imagination of of acts of is that life is uh, that this idea of life is is so much more, right? It's just this expansive understanding and that and that we are we are participating in that. So that's another I thought about that as well. Yeah, participating in it as community. Um I just want to highlight that that was where you began with uh Caroline is that we're that we individually are participating in that uh as a community of life. You you are echoing uh, Matt in that. And um, I lift that up because um, the the author of Luke Acts is writing this so that this one, Theophilus, would know the things that they have heard, heard from members of the community. And so bringing, bringing this knowledge to this individual, why? So that this individual can participate in this, in this community. Um, and if, if, if I may push into uh, the psalm, yeah. As long as I can come back to the guy at the at the gate and Acts after that. Absolutely. Um, uh, I, I was just going to um, put on there in terms of this crying out to God uh, that the psalmist makes uh, this this request to be answered that God would be gracious. Um, it. Is uh, I'm looking at verse six. Oh, that we might see some good. That is what people are asking for. That they might see some good. Not just to believe that there is good, but they might see. And 
hopefully, Matt, that will allow you to pull it back to. Absolutely. (laughs) We can always find a connection. Yeah, one thing to note, and this comes out of what you both were saying in terms of participating uh, as community, but we don't see it really in the um in this in this lection from acts three or even next week in acts four but the man who is healed is present for all of this you get the reference to it Uh in uh in verse 12 where he says we may you know that we made him walk is assume he's standing right there and even after peter and john are arrested the man is still there with them We don't know his name. He doesn't really function in the scene after he's healed and jumps up. But he's the one who draws the crowd. His healing is the thing that draws the crowd. And he stays with them. He's present with them. So there's something interesting about preaching what Peter preaches with this man that everybody has seen sitting by the gate for years and years and years, standing next to him. And then as well, next week, when the opposition comes, Here's somebody who's in his own body bears the the oh, the evidence, right, of this restoration and this new life and the author of life. I mean, all of these things, and even for the preaching. And it's not to make him into an object lesson, but to imagine the way in which he now joins this community and bears in his own, again, his body this this sign of resurrection. This is interesting. Which again, in Psalm four, I think you're right with that. You know, usually the Psalms illustrate the Old Testament reading when the fun things about Easter is they, I think they're chosen to kind of pull something out of the Acts reading. We don't often, often in the lectionary have the Psalm. Right. Uh, with that. That may be like, um, distinctively tied to the New Testament, but, and it's a short Psalm, which I always like when you can read an entire Psalm in, yeah. <laughs> in one sitting. <laughs> Well, and the man, the man, I mean, that's such an important, uh, that's such an important point because the man is then also a witness. Uh, and, right. and so it's not, you know, not only the audience there, but it's the, the man himself and a witness, as you said, in his body. And, uh, and so, in, and when you think about, again, what difference does resurrection make, in our daily lives are when, how, and where are we actively working for life for the other hmm. and, and pointing out where that's not happening, where we actually care about the life. So there's a, there is this component of the resurrection, particularly with what we've been talking about that, that that's the seeing the good, right? as you were talking about joy, but it puts, it, it places that on our heart to, to do that. And to, uh, that that's part of what resurrection means. And if we're not, how, how is it that we are really kind of truncating the meaning of the resurrection and the kind of impact and, and power it has in our lives and the lives of others? Yeah. And similarly too, that's, I think it's a really good point. And similarly too, it's, it puts on us, as preachers to think about how also do damaged bodies also bear mm-hmm. witness to resurrection, that this mm-hmm. doesn't become a kind of ableist Mm-mm. thing, right. but how do you, how you talk about a broken body, a frail body, an ill body, a dying body also bearing witness uh, to the power of the resurrection. So mm-hmm. I would mm-hmm. find a way to work that into your sermon if you're going that route as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and the commentary was helpful there as well. Uh, of calling that out, but it's almost, I mean, when I was thinking about this, it's, it's not unlike the man, um, the healing of the man born blind in John, where it's the, the healing itself is, is one thing, but it's this larger, uh, as you were saying earlier, joy of, of life and community, whatever that then ends up looking like. Uh, and so the emphasis is not so much on the healing as it is, um, wh- where is it that where is it that life enters our lives, uh, and that can happen in many and prof- many different and profound ways. Which uh, you just allowed us to point ourselves to First John. Ooh, <laughs> how did uh, I do that, Joy? <laughs> in 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 this idea, in terms of the community, I mean, mm-hmm. this, this is that verse, First uh, John three. Uh, see what love the Father has given us, that we might be called children 
uh, part of the community of God uh, because that is who we are. Uh, so uh, if, um, I, as Matt last week kind of um, invited some, um, if you were willing to take this uh, journey through First John uh, in uh, these next few weeks, um, some of the ideas that we've talked about through uh, uh, the other text are actually touched on in uh, First John. And uh, we can begin to uh, look at what it means to be a community of faith because of what God has done in Jesus. Well, and particularly as we get into uh, it, partly this week, but then, but then next week, yes. that the mark of that community, a resurrection community, is love. And so, the that the the, the attention to and the commitment to the flourishing of life is is really not separated from uh, from the love of God. And so how do you how is it that you we we talk about that integration or that inability to separate out love and life and that uh, that they're that they're expressive fundamentally of this profound, unbelievable love of God. <laughs>